Hi, I'm Jeremy Kirk with Intel 471, and welcome to Happy Hunting, which is Intel 471's threat hunting program, where we learn how to find malicious behaviors in your logging systems. Uh, with me today is Lee Arkinall, who's a senior threat hunt analyst. How are you, Lee? Doing great. Thanks, Jeremy. All right, let's get into it. Um, today, we're going to hunt for behaviors associated with APT29. Some of you may know this group by other names, which include uh, Cozy Bear, Midnight Blizzard, The Dukes, Grizzly Step, and there's several others. This is a Russian state-sponsored group that conducts operations on behalf of Russia's SDR, which is also known as its Foreign Intelligence Service. It's been active since at least 2008, generally conducts operations that are based on Russia's strategic policy goals. It also engages in a bit of a IP theft which has been noted to help channeled into Russian businesses. A few key points about this group. It has a really high degree of technical sophistication. It's well-resourced and has really good operational security. It generally seeks persistent access to targets that are of strategic value and have high intelligence value for Russia. And it gradually evolves its tactics, techniques, and procedures in order to maintain that access and elude detection. A couple notable attacks uh, by APT29 over the last few years one was the famous SolarWinds incident. And so this was a supply chain compromise of the software company SolarWinds, which makes a type of IT management platform called Orion. And in this attack, APT29 trojanized a software update for Orion. And this resulted in a backdoor called Sunburst being installed when organizations that used Orion installed those software updates. This affected thousands of SolarWinds customers, including U.S government customers, customers outside that as well. Quick question, Jeremy. Uh, you mentioned that it was Trojanized. So what does that mean for customers? Um, and what does it mean for the indicators of compromise and really detecting it? Yeah, it's good. So basically the SVR had gotten into SolarWinds software update pipeline. And instead of that legitimate software update going out, it was a backdoor instead. So this is really quite tricky to detect because the Trojanized software update, which is basically the backdoor, was signed with SolarWinds' just normal digital uh, signing certificate, which basically guarantees that the software that you're using is legitimate from the company that actually pushed it down. Um, so this is really tricky to detect, and that's why, I mean, a lot of people became infected with this. So, you know, you may be able to retroactively tell once they figured out that, oh, wait, this software update was actually a backdoor instead. Like you would be able to use that hash conceivably to detect that. But at the time, you wouldn't. So basically, if you downloaded this Trojanized update, you'd have to be looking then at that point because you're infected for behaviors, that sort of lateral movement, privilege escalation, all those sorts of behaviors that come with, you know, a sophisticated adversary leveraging an initial point of access and then, you know, moving on through the systems. So solar winds acting strange would be a nice way to detect it. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We'll go into another uh, notable attack, and this is from earlier this year. So APT29 compromised Microsoft's corporate email systems. Uh, this was around about a year ago, around the end of 2023, and they attempted to access source code and other parts of the corporate network. They also created malicious OAuth applications that had high privileges that were able to access other inboxes, Microsoft corporate inboxes, and those belonging to U.S. government agencies. And so they were all kind of able to like sort of mint keys to whatever they wanted to access, which is, again, is a sign of APT's sort of highly sophisticated tactics. So one last note, uh, and this comes from Microsoft's write-up of APT-29s into its uh, corporate email systems, is that Midnight Blizzard used residential proxies to conduct its attacks. And so residential proxies are basically just kind of like consumer IP addresses. They could be compromised IoT devices, things that are on networks that wouldn't normally raise suspicion that haven't been flagged for trouble. So for instance, if you're an attacker and you're using a known bulletproof hosting network, that's problematic because those IP ranges are probably going to be blocked straight away by networks. But they rotated these residential IPs for their attacks really, really frequently. And so that means that the, you know, merely blocking IPs used by this group is just, you know, you're chasing the tail of a dog that's faster than you. So with that, I'll turn it over to Lee, who's going to talk a little bit more about indicators of compromise and how they relate to threat hunting. So take it away, Lee. 
Thanks, Jeremy. So that's a conversation I love having, kind of putting the misconceptions to bed. But one thing I want to mention before I continue is I feel like that's crazy that Microsoft and these large organizations can get compromised uh, and not know it. I am not sh naming and shaming anyone at all because it, it all ha it's going to happen to everyone at some point in time. The severity of it will probably be different. Um, but if Microsoft is unable to detect these APT-29s and like these sophisticated groups, the question may be like, what, what chance do we have? The best thing I can offer is that if those adversaries aren't using novelty malware, so you think about the ransomware, you think Cobalt Strike, off the shelf tools with default configurations, if they're creating their own tools and bringing that to the game, the one thing that still stands true is the behaviors. We might not have a malicious hash to associate with the tool, but what we can look for is suspicious things like weird network connections. We can look for strange privilege escalation. All these different behaviors that exist that this brand new tool will still leverage. So for this discussion, we're talking about IOCs and behaviors. Now, when it comes to indicators of compromise, really what we're thinking about are quick wins. And here's why. We got Intel reports. We got malware that we can gather hashes from. We got virus total that we can use for hunting. All these hashes are associated with known malicious tools and software. Adversaries have control of these IOCs. If you think about the IPs they are using, you would think about the domains they set up to serve up malware or uh, you know command and control commands. What you have is something that they can control. If they notice that their malware is being detected by VirusTotal, they can change something in insignificant in the code, like a variable name or some other string, and that will change the entire hash. So now you thought you were detecting the piece of malware through that one bad hash, but now they switched it and they changed the game. IPs and domains are the same way. A domain gets burned, they stand up another. That gets burned, they stand up another. They probably have five to 10 or even hundreds at their disposal already, especially if they're nation state. So IOCs, it's a quick win. Like Jeremy said, you can retroactively look at this in your environment to say, does this hash exist? And if it does, there's a good chance that it's malicious. Because with hashes, they normally stay malicious. IPs, not so much. But if you have this malicious hash, you can go investigate. Now, what happens is sometimes you get a false sense of security where you say, I'm looking for these indicators of compromise. And then you search for it and you find zero results. That could mean, and some people like to think that, hey, we're not compromised. I would strongly encourage you not to think like that because if those IOC changes and you didn't know it, then you're looking for the wrong thing. Now, when it comes to behaviors, now behaviors, I'm talking about privilege escalation. I'm talking about using living off land binaries like PowerShell. Uh, Windows Command Shell, Python, all these goals that adversaries have to achieve to have this, a successful compromise, these are what we're talking about behaviors. Threat hunting focuses on these behaviors in almost the same way that the scientific method looks at hypotheses. It's a hypothesis-based procedure. We read an Intel report, we say, hey, we see this malware is gaining uh, persistence by creating a scheduled task. Let's look at that into our environment. How would that look? You know, you have your hypothesis. I think scheduled tasks are malicious. All right, cool. Let's research it. How have malicious scheduled tasks looked in the past? What are adversaries doing these days? What values can we grab? And what artifacts exist in the command line arguments or the telemetry from scheduled tasks being created? And then you say, okay, let's create a query. Whatever tool you're using, you create your query and you start hunting. Now, the problem is because you're hunting for the tools that adversaries are using, the living off land binaries, which exist natively on your Windows environment, the problem is false positives. Because if the adversaries are using scheduled tasks, there's a very good chance that your corporation or your environment has scheduled tasks already, legitimately, to update your computer, to log you off after X amount of time, to update this, update that, and so on. So what you're going to do is you're going to look for scheduled tasks and boom, you're going to be greeted by all these false positives. Your goal is to weed through the noise, figure out what's normal and what's expected, learn your environment, and then you'll be able to see what's anomalous or even find a malicious activity. So going back to those three aspects of threat hunting, you want to learn your environment so that you know what exists. You, that's the whole tribal knowledge idea that you get. You get finding anomalies. So once you know what exists, you can find those anomalies because they don't look the same. And then finally, you can look for evidence of malicious behaviors. Sometimes the malicious behaviors kind of stick out right away. If we know that APT1234 always uses the scheduled task named happy hunting, 
We can easily look for a scheduled task being created called happy hunting. That's just their behavior. But it kind of gets a little harder when you talk about where are the files they're referencing in the scheduled task? What command line arguments are they using? What process are they using to launch this? And so on. But once again, knowing these behaviors is highly critical. When we think about APT29 or Cozy Bear or Midnight Blizzard, whatever you want to call it, if we want to take a look at the MITRE attack matrix, we can see what behaviors they've used in the past. So we talked about IOCs. There's lots of lists out there. There's a lot of sites that provide that information for you. That virus total is a big one. You know, you have a hash, you drop it in there, you get results to say, hey, it's malicious or we've seen it before. But when it comes to behaviors, the number one spot that I always think about is the minor tech matrix. This is just a hub of information whenever it comes to behaviors. And even we can come over here to the CTI tab and hit groups. If we come back to APT29, what we have is not only associated group descriptions or the explanation of who they are or where they're from, but we also have campaigns they've conducted. And what I'm really looking for is the techniques used. So if we think about, hey, you know what? I'm hunting for APT29. If that's my goal, instead of looking for a certain tool or a certain behavior, I can come here and see what they've used in the past. Because when it's threat hunting and you're looking for behaviors, the thing we like to think about is you're looking for the human aspect. I know when I wake up, I do the same things in the same order almost every day. That's just the behavior and my habits that I do. When it comes to attacks, if you think about the human behavior, they're going to do something they're comfortable with that works and is convenient. They're not going to make hacking harder for themselves just because. We're going to have to find them and make them make it harder for themselves or use a tool they're not comfortable with. But coming here to the behaviors, we can see a lot that's going on. We see abuse elevation control mechanisms. We see account discovery. So they're looking, you know, they're looking at your environment to see what exists. But it also mentions SolarWinds compromise, which has its own tab, which is great. And once we've come to the SolarWinds tab, what we can see is the techniques that were associated with that attack specifically. So once again, count discovery, but more importantly, if we come down here to the one we're really interested in today, we're looking at application layer protocol, web protocols, and you can see it says, during the SolarWinds compromise, APT29 used HTTP for C2 and data exfiltration. That can mean a lot of things. There's a lot of ways that you can hunt for that, but that's really where we come in to help everyone out. So if you come to the Hunter 471 platform and you have your community account that you signed up for, you can access a bunch of different hunt packages that we have labeled community. So they're free. It's a great place to start your hunting journey. Now, what this is looking for, titled Cobalt Strike Beacon Default and C2 Structure, if we come down to the overview, what we see is that it's a use case meant to identify Cobalt Strike DNS command and control via the default structure applied to adversary domains. Now, it mentions the default structure. So if the adversary is trying to use Cobalt Strike, trying to get into your environment real quick with a lot less effort, then they might just use the tool out of the box. But how do we hunt for this default structure of DNS command and control? Well, if we come down to the query logic table, we find that we're looking in the field being the query. Specifically, we're looking at DNS activity, and we can see the value is this nice regular expression. Basically, we're looking for three lowercase alphabetical characters followed by dot stage or a post with some numbers after it. So these are the values that will exist in that DNS string. But how does that help, and how can we look for activity? Well, depending on your tool, you come up to the detection rules. And we're going to use uh, CrowdStrike log scale in this example. You drop down and we have the query ready for you already. And yes, there's a lot more than that query logic showed, but that's because we are doing our best to leverage what we can inside the tool itself. I have a question so, for you, Lee. Absolutely. So my question is, when these DNS queries are going out, is this because the beacon is querying its own DNS servers that it's selected or it's trying to use DNS servers that of the machines that it's on? So whenever the beacon lands in your environment, its goal is to reach back out to the adversary controlled domain. Once it reaches out to that pre-configured domain, and it could be over a lot of different protocols, it could be HTTP, HTTPS. I mean, I've seen Telegram. I've seen Britney Spears' Twitter become a C2 server. <laughs> uh, but there's all these tricky ways to do it. But the idea remains the same, is that they want your compromised machine to reach out to their controlled infrastructure 
to continue their mission of compromising further. So issuing further commands, gathering information, whatever step is along the way, that's what's going on here. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at event a simple name um, or the event type being DNS requests. We have that regular expression dropped in, but let's take a look at what that would look like in tool. So once we drop our query into CrowdStrike in this case, we see that we have results. The first thing I would highly recommend is that you don't freak out. You just read the data and you see what's going on. It could be a lot of false positive traffic. But in some cases, we've created these queries to get pretty specific or as close to the malicious activity as possible. So looking at this, once again, looking at the domain name containing those values, making sure that it's event simple name DNS requests. Now I'm going to collapse this real quick. We see there are a couple hits. From here, once we have our hits, and I'll expand this a bit, the biggest concern is where do we go next? For example, here we can see what the process was that granted it. So we see PowerShell. And if we scroll over, we can see all this information as well. So the context based file name or the process that created this activity, the domain name it's reaching out to, the responding DNS server. But the idea is we see PowerShell behaving in a way that makes it look like a cobalt strike beacon. But the best artifact that we can go off right now is that PowerShell activity. So my next step would be to dig into what other things PowerShell is doing at this time or around this time, how often this has happened on this computer. Now I only see one over one day, but that doesn't mean that it was the only instance. It could be once a day. It could be once every week and so on. But the idea is you want to see how many times that this is happening, follow that PowerShell trail, and really see what other behaviors exist around it. So thank you everyone for watching. And thank you, Jeremy, for joining me today on today's Happy Hunting video. Today, we focused on Cozy Bear, exploring how it leaves critical traces that can make all the difference if they're discovered. Um, using the Hunter 471 platform and resources like Cobalt Strike Beacon default C2 structure, you'll have the tools to track patterns used by adversaries like Cozy Bear. For those wanting to dive deeper, get your free community account on Hunter 471 using the link below to access a comprehensive library of advanced threat hunting packages, detailed analyst notes, and proactive recommendations tailored to adversaries like Cozy Bear. These resources are designed to strengthen your threat hunting capabilities and keep your organization secure. Thank you for joining, and as always, happy hunting.